Well, good morning again. Um, we are continuing in our series today in the Acts of the Apostles. And if you remember, last week, Peter had gone out of Jerusalem, was in Lydda. Now, he's there, he's performed a miracle, news of that is spread everywhere, and that brings us into the story today. But I want to start by just sort of making an observation. And the observation is that if there is one obvious truth that the Bible teaches for people who want to walk with Jesus, that truth is that we are called to help one another. Would you agree with that? From beginning to end, the Lord constantly is urging and, and instructing and commanding that our lives are to be used for helping other people. But the problem comes that sometimes the motivations for helping or the ways to go about helping, should I help, shouldn't I help, if I help, is that enabling or not enabling, sometimes all of that can get very convoluted. Or we can, we can find places in our heart that are a little hard towards people, and particularly you know people that we have some disagreement with or we don't know, or there's just so many different things that can get in the way of doing what the Lord has said to do, simply helping, having a life that is used for the help of other people. Now in the story today, what we're going to see is Peter helping, and he is going to be following an example that he's seen in the life of Jesus. And as the story goes on, we're going to get some clues, some ideas of what do I do when God brings someone my way to help? Because I believe on a regular basis, God is bringing people across our paths that he calls us to help. So let's jump into the story. Now he's in, this, in the town of Lydda, about nine miles away from Joppa. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas. It's a good name if you're having a little girl, Dorcas. Call her Dorcas. Simply means a gazelle. Well, in the, the English language, it sounds kind of rough. Tabitha sort of rolls off the tongue. That's the Aramaic. Dorcas is the Greek. But it is a beautiful name that just means a gazelle. Something light and graceful and beautiful. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Now this is the situation that Peter finds himself in. He has been performing miracles as God has been working in him, but he has never been called on to step into the situation where someone has died in order to raise that person back to life. If you try to put yourself in his mindset for a minute, in his situation for a minute, it's absolutely overwhelming. I don't know if you have ever felt God calling you to do something that seems so much bigger than you that you just kind of shrinked away and said, not me. God can't possibly want me. Or if God has brought someone your way and you were the one that God wanted to work in that person's life, he had everything set up for that, but it just seems so daunting, so big and so overwhelming. And the response to that is to simply say, not me, Lord. So Peter is now in this situation, and he has never been used by God to raise someone from the dead, but he has seen it done. He saw Jesus raise three different individuals from the grave. Son of a, a woman in a city named Nain, Lazarus, you remember him, and the little girl of a man who ran a synagogue, who ruled a synagogue. He's seen it done. He knows that God has the power. God has the power to do it. And he knows that death being overcome by life is a primary facet to God's kingdom. God is a God of life. And so life overcoming death is part of what it means to be in God's kingdom. So he's got that, but he himself has never stepped into the situation. So what do we do? 
What do you do when God brings someone your way? How do you help people that God brings your way? Well, here's the very first thing we're going to learn from the story as it goes on. The very first thing that I, I have to do if I really want God to use me in the lives of other people is I have to be open to people who are hurting. I have to be open to that. It's very easy to close our hearts to people who are hurting. For whatever reasons, things that just bother us about that person or about a situation, it's easy to live our lives with our own stresses, saying to ourselves, well, I've got enough problems of my own. I can't even take care of my own issues. How can I possibly help someone else? And you know, in our society, the American society, life is so fast Pace. I'm convinced that you and I blow by people on a daily basis that God is gently nudging and prompting us to be open to. They're hurting, and if there's anything Jesus gave us an example of, it was going into the lives of people who are hurting and bringing the grace and the love and the power of God to bear on their situation. That was his whole life that was ultimately seen in the work of the cross where he, in one act, dealt with a whole broken and hurting humanity by dying in our place. That's the example. And if I'm unwilling to let my heart be open, even the slightest bit open, then I'm never going to be available for God to use. Now, Peter saw Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He saw how Jesus lived his life. He saw what Jesus did, how he interacted with people. And not just the so-called religious people. Jesus virtually spent his whole adult life around people who were hurting. Broken people, people who were outcasts, people who were thought to be just the, the, the worst people in society. Those were the people he went and spent time with. Those were the hurting people. People. Sometimes they just look like you and me, you know, work a day, everyday people. But you and I are hurting people too, aren't we? We have things that we need God's help with as well. But he didn't spend a lot of time sitting in circles with religious folks having theological debates. He just didn't have time for that. His life was devoted to loving, caring, and helping people because that's what God is like. Now look at this passage. He had this in his mind too. I'm convinced that when these men came from Joppa while he's in Lydda and said, come help us and explained briefly the situation, I'm convinced this was in his mind. Jesus told him this when they were just beginning to follow. This is the words of Jesus out of Matthew 10. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Now here's the key phrase in this whole statement. Freely you've received, freely give. You hear that? Freely you've received. Freely give. Everyone who steps into relationship with the Father has been given stuff by God that we are to give out to others, to give away. Sometimes it's resources. Sometimes it's gifts that we have. Sometimes it's just words of encouragement. Sometimes it's all kinds of things. But to take what the Father's given us and has given us freely and not share it Jesus tells stories about people like that, too. People who are entrusted, but who hoard, or who refuse to be compassionate, refuse to have open hearts for whatever the reason may be. So if I want to help people, I truly want to have that fruitful aspect to my life, the very first thing I must be willing to do is simply be open. Open to people who are hurting, who are broken, now, the second thing we're going to see in the story is this. You can jot this down. If I'm open, then second, I must be willing to do what God puts in front of me. Now, notice what we're saying here. Be willing to do what God puts in front of me. Even Jesus didn't heal everybody who needed healing. Do you know that? He would go into a place where there were all kinds of hurting, broken, uh, wounded people, and he might just go to one and heal just that one. He didn't feel that it was his role to heal everyone that came in his path. He understood that if he was open to hurting people, the Father would show him who he wanted to work in. Being willing to do what God says. Now, here's the kicker in that. What God usually wants is way beyond what you feel you can do on your own. 
You know, pulling out a few dollars and helping someone who comes by saying, can you help me? That's not very difficult. But often God has much deeper, broken issues in the lives of people he's trying to heal. Bigger needs, deeper wounds. Things that he desires you to step into simply to be available to him to work through. It is an amazing thing when you think that God would want you to use your wife, or wife, your life, uh, as that was a Freudian thing, but we're not going to go down that path, to use your life as an ambassador for him to touch the lives of other people that he loves. It is an amazing thought. Now, Peter gets this. Look at what happens. They say, come, this is what's going on. Now look at the very first statement. Peter went with them. See, he's willing. He's willing to step into a situation that's completely bigger than anything he could possibly manage on his own. He's, he's willing. He says yes. He senses God in this. When he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Now, I want you to put yourself in this situation. This woman that everybody adores has died. She has been a great example of helping. She has cared for other widows. Now, I get the sense she herself is a widow. There's no husband present, no children even present. But she has devoted her life to helping other people. And now that she's dead, all of the widows are grieving, they're heartbroken. The whole community is shaken up by this. This was this godly woman that everybody looked to. And Peter walks into the situation, and there she is, laid out on the table, having been washed, having been prepped for her burial. Um, and the way they would do that, generally, is they'd find a cold cave or something they'd hewn out. They would put the body there, they would wrap it in ointments and, and wrap it with cloths, and they would just let the body deteriorate. They would take the bones, put them in a box, and put them up on a shelf. And so you would go into tombs, and still can go into tombs in the Middle East, all over the Middle East, not just uh, the Jerusalem or Israel area. And you can find these, these caves or these ossuaries, these bone boxes. It was how they did it. And that's what they're waiting to do with her. But there's a hope. There's, there's a hope that maybe Peter could make a difference. But he's standing there, and he's looking at her, and he's like, Wow, she, she was very important to this community. And the widows are grieving. So he sees all of these old women just brokenhearted. And his heart is broken. What does he do? What would you do? It's a tough situation. You know, I'll never forget the very first funeral I was called on to officiate. I was freshly out of seminary. And a neighbor of a friend had passed away. They had no church family, no pastor. And the neighbor asked my friend, would your pastor do my wife's funeral? And I'd never done it before. So I went and I talked to a, a couple of friends of mine who were pastors, and they gave me a little bit of insight, and I felt like, okay, I, I, think, I, can, I think I can manage this. And so I, uh, I got the address, and I went over to the house, and I knocked on the door, and I, the, the man whose wife had passed away opened the door. And uh, I walked in, and his son and daughter, both older than I, uh, were sitting in there. And I greeted everyone. Hello, I'm Kevin. I'm Kevin. I'm going to officiate your mother's funeral. And, of course, they were grieving. And a lot of times in death, people are confused. And they, they just the whole world's turned upside down. And she was definitely kind of the one who ran the home. You know what I mean? And they were just kind of in a bit of confusion. And I felt extremely outmatched for what I had to do. I, I just wanted to say, well, I'm really sorry, about face and run. But I walked in anyway, and I knew that this was something that the Lord was nudging me to do. And I knew, even though I would have put it differently then, I needed to be willing to be available. So I walked in, and the man was sitting in his chair, kind of an easy chair in the Kids were sitting, adult children were sitting on the couch. There's a chair over here. So I walked, and I sat down in the chair, and he went, <gasps> and I looked at him, and he said, that's her chair. No one has sat in that chair since she passed away. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a gas station attendant. That's what I'm going to do for a living. I, this pastor thing's already not working out. 
Oh, it was a horrible, awkward moment. But you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to trip and stumble. You've got to be willing to be in awkward moments and not know what to do. You've got to be willing to make just kind of rookie, boneheaded, silly mistakes. I didn't know it was her chair. I'd never been in their house. In my life, I'd never met them in my life till that day. But somehow in the midst of all of that stuff, their grief and confusion, my mistakes, not knowing what I'm doing, being completely outmatched for the situation, somehow Jesus showed up in that room and began to minister to their spirits and began to open up opportunities to talk about his love and his grace. Would have never happened if I wasn't willing. You have to be willing. Willing when you feel the Father prompting you to say, I don't want to do it, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to do what the Father is putting in front of me. Now, the story goes on. He is there, and they've shown him all of these things, and he sees the situation. Now, he's going to do something very unexpected, but it is exactly what Jesus did, how he handled this situation once. And here's the third thing I want to give you. The third thing I need to do as I'm going into this situation, and by the way, this is not very hard to do if you feel completely outmatched, and that is to be dependent on God. His plans, His power, not on my plans, not on my power. Sometimes when God calls us into these larger-than-life situations, it is perfectly set for you to simply go in and say, I don't know what I should do. Now you're in a good position to listen. Now you're in a good place to do what God is wanting you to do. Peter doesn't know. He knows he should go. He knows he needs to be present, to be available. The Father said, and Jesus said, I've given freely to you. You give freely to others. You be open to the people I bring your way. You be willing to go when I tell you to go. But now as he walks in, what is God going to do? He's here. He's available. He's been faithful. Now, what will the Father do? The story goes on. Peter sent them, now he's talking about all these widows. The room is full, this upper room. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. See his dependency? He gets down, he prays, he listens to what God is going to say. He wants to hear what God is up to at this moment. And then he hears, turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha. Get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. It's just happened. Because he was willing, because he was available, because he was dependent and saying, God, you have your way here. He wasn't worried about how he looked. He wasn't worried about what was accomplished. He was only concerned to be faithful and wanted God to have his way. And because he did that, God works through him to raise this woman from the dead. That's what God likes to do. That's what God does through common people. Peter is not a trained Pharisee. He doesn't have a lot of theological background. He's not known as a particular, a particular a smart guy or entrepreneurial or, or good with really anything. He's a, a workaday guy who, for the first 30 years of his life, got up at night, ate a meal, went out on the Sea of Galilee, threw out a net, pulled up as much fish as he could, came in at morning, cleaned the fish and packed them in salt, took them to a market so someone could sell them, mended his net, and went to bed. That's been three decades for Peter. And that's all he's done. Because God doesn't need what you bring God's already got a plan and a power. What he needs from us is to simply be available. And when we go into the situation to say, here I am, Lord, I'm ready for whatever you want. Many, 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 many years ago, there was a man, an older man, who had been very kind to me. 
I knew him through a, a church situation, and he had kind of been available in some difficult times for me and had been kind of a real champion for me. You know what I'm talking about, people like that? Those guys that are just in your corner and you know it. And um, I heard from his pastor, I hadn't had much contact with him for a while, and I heard from his pastor that he had gotten very, very ill from some form of cancer and was going to die. And I said, oh, man, I, I really want to, to see him. I, you know, I mean, it's just it's such an overwhelming situation. And his pastor said, well, you, you need to go this week. You need to go this week uh, because he's not going to be here next week. Well, I prayed. And I felt the Father nudging me to go. In all honesty, I was scared to death, and I did not want to go. It was such an awkward situation. I didn't know what to say to this man. I didn't have anything to say. And so I just kind of kept praying. And I felt as I prayed, you know, it wasn't lightning bolts from heaven or this big voice or anything, but I just felt that I wanted to just go see him one last time and say thank you. Thank you for being in my corner. Thank you for helping me when, when I needed help. But I also felt like the Lord was kind of nudging me to pray for him, to just pray for him, just pray over him, and to just pray God's blessing on him. Well, that felt awkward. It's one thing to, you know, to say, man, thank you. It's another thing to pray for someone that you feel is sort of a spiritual giant, and you're a pygmy, you know? It just, he should be praying for me before he dies. I should get as much prayer from him before, while I got the chance. So I set a day in my mind when I could do it, that it would fit in the schedule. I knew I had to do it that week because his pastor said, is there much time left? So I, I braced myself. I got in my car. I drove, it's kind of a distance, but I drove to where he and his wife lived. And as I'm pulling up, now, you know how this is, right? You want to get in and out so quick because it feels so awkward. As I'm pulling up, another car pulls up right by me, and five of his closest friends pile out of that car. And they say, hi, and I tell them who I am, and they oh, we're here to see him too, and, and we're his pals, and we blah, blah. I'm like, oh, Lord, maybe I should have come at night. Now, it's really awkward. So we all walk in together, and I just sit on the couch. And these guys, you know, they've known each other since, like, Noah's flood. You know what I'm saying? And they're interacting, they're laughing, they're telling jokes and stuff. And, and he's sitting there, this man, he's very, very weak. He's turned kind of this, I don't know any other way to say it, this ghastly shade of yellow. He's just, he's, he's washed out. He's given up medications. He's not eating. He knows he, he's any day, and maybe that day. And so they're kind of chatting with him, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, man, and I'm watching my, my watch, and I'm thinking, these guys are going to talk for the next two hours. If I'm going to do it, I just need to do it. But I didn't want to do it. I wanted to say, hey, well, i got to go now. It just felt so awkward. But I just felt the Father nudging. So I said, hey, um, can I say something? I said, okay. And so I said, I think, and notice how I did it, I'm such a chicken. I said, I think we should all pray for him. And they said, well, you're, you're a pastor. I said, yeah. They said, why don't you pray for him? Okay. So... I stood up, and I knew this was how the Lord wanted me to do it. I walked over, and I knelt down on both knees. And I said, could I hold your hand? And these old guys are watching me. These bunch of old coots just staring at me. And I'm sure I'm failing and making an idiot of myself. And he said, sure. He was a, he's a super godly guy. I took his hand, which was very cold, by the way. And I said, I just want to say thank you to you because you were there for me when I really needed somebody. And now I just want to pray. He said, sure. And I just prayed. 30 seconds. God, 
Thank you for him. Please, please be with him and bless him. I know you live in him. And then I prayed that final thing. I felt God nudging me to pray. Do whatever you want in him right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I got up real quick. And then I said to him one more time, thank you so much. And I left and the, his friends kind of hung out and they sort of filed out a little bit too. In fact, one of them as I'm walking out said, you know, when we visit our friends, we always come together because it's so hard to be in this situation. And I thought, oh, thank goodness, it's not just me. I was a chicken here. And I went and I got in my car and I drove away and I felt, okay, I did what I wanted to do. I said, thankful. I was faithful to the Father's prompting and I felt some real peace. I thought, okay, I, you know, when, when his pastor calls me and tells me they're having the funeral, you know, I'm going to be in the front row. Three or four weeks went by. I don't really remember. It was a very busy time in my life. And I called his pastor and I said, um, you know, he's passed away yet. He's gone to be with the Lord. And he said, no, no. And his pastor kind of chuckled. He says, just the opposite. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, he was, his doctor was saying any time, I said, yeah. He said he'd quit all of his meds, and he really wasn't able to eat. So he was, he was failing quickly. I said, yeah. He said, well, suddenly he got an appetite. And he asked his wife, would you make me something to eat? And he started to eat. And he went to bed, and he woke up the next day, and he was hungry again. And over the course of the next week, the color began to come back to his face. And he didn't touch any of his medications. And last Sunday, he was at church with his wife. And when he walked in, we all celebrated. We can't believe he's here. And I said, I got to go now. What could I do? I knelt down and I said, that's what you like to do, God. That's who you are. Life always overcomes death when God's there, however he wants to do it. It always does. It doesn't always turn out that way. I will tell you of everyone I've ever prayed for who was at that point, most have gone home to be with the Lord, but in great peace, you know. But in this situation, God had something different planned. And when he worked that, it was so obvious that that had nothing to do with me. Nothing. But everything to do with a God who likes to show up in situations and work. Now, I've, I've been in that situation many, many times, of course, and sometimes all you sense is a peace. Sometimes you sense God saying, no, there's more I want to do, keep praying. It's always kind of different. The key is to be available. The key is to say, yes, Lord, I'll go. And when you get there, the key is to say, I don't know what you want to do here, Lord, but I'm ready to listen because it's about your plan. It's about your power. It's about what you want to do. Now, let me give you a final one. The final one is that as I'm there, as I'm available, as I'm willing, as I'm dependent, I then need to make sure that I am practical in the help I give. Practical. What can I do with my hands, with my resources, that's going to help this person? Look at what Peter does. She's come back to life. She's sat up. She's opened her eyes. She clearly is weak. But look what happens. Peter took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. So he just does something practical. He just gives her a hand and helps her up. It's very practical. It's something anyone can do, even Peter. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon, and that's where we're going to see him next time we're in the story. Now, 
These four things, we see them in the life of Jesus, we see them in the life of Peter, but I think one of the most incredible illustrations of this, I'm going to close with this story just so you guys know. Keep fanning, give me five more minutes, okay? Is in a teenage girl named Katie. Katie was an 18-year-old living in the suburbs of Tennessee. She had everything going for her. She was very popular. She was very smart. She had her life all laid out for her. She was attending and very faithful with her mother, her father, and her brother going to the Catholic Church there. Katie was very popular on campus. Katie had the boyfriend that all the girls wanted. Katie had the nice yellow convertible that Daddy bought her. Katie had everything planned out. It was the perfect American dream for little Katie. But her church was doing a mission trip to Uganda. And so Katie and her mom decided they would go to Uganda. Now, I don't know what you know about Uganda, but the majority of people there are very impoverished. And I'm talking nothing. They have nothing. And so Katie went with her church, her mother, and she saw the situation. And when she saw the situation and she saw the people, and especially the children, it was as if God whispered something in her ear. See, she was open to go on the trip. She was willing to be there. And God began to speak. And so Katie was impacted by this trip. So the, the trip ended. It's only a couple of weeks. They went back to Tennessee, and she was going to start college. But she told her parents, now get this, Mom and Dad, I'm not going to go to college when I graduate this spring. Instead, I'm going to go back to Uganda and teach that, that class for children. They need a kindergarten teacher. I'm going to go fill that role for a year before I go to college. Now, what her mom and dad did is exactly what Elisa and I would do. Sweetheart, you're not stepping out of this place. But Jesus said, well, let me take it up with him, okay? You're staying here. I'm not letting my 18-year-old little girl go to Uganda by herself. But Katie persisted. She fought. She begged. And finally, Mom and Dad said, fine, we're just going to turn you into the hands of the Lord. You know, that's where she should have been all along anyway. So she said goodbye to her friends. She got on the plane. She flew to Uganda for a year of teaching kindergarten. She taught kindergarten, but it didn't take long before her heart was ripped open by the devastation of the children she was teaching. She soon found out that most of the children that she thought should come and get some education couldn't afford it because the way they did school, you had to pay for it, and nobody had any money. She discovered children on the streets everywhere. Some teenagers who were in such a desperate situation, they would find something like glue or something left on the side of the road to sniff just to take away the pain. And her heart was ripped open because she was willing to let it be ripped open. And she felt the father nudging her to do something. Katie, will you be willing? So she said, I'll be willing. I don't know what to do. So she began to pray. She had many, many restless nights. Many, many talks with God. Many, many tears seeing the situation and recognizing it was so much bigger than she was. But as the time went on, this 18-year-old little girl from the suburbs of Tennessee began to adopt children. And by the time the year was over, she had adopted 13 little girls. Had brought them into her home. Had written all of her friends and said, if you want to help feed these girls, here's how you do it. She learned to pull chiggers out of the children's feet because they didn't have shoes. She was going to train to be a nurse. She didn't know her training was going to be like that. She just was spilled out for the Lord. And as she cared for these children, more and more kids began to show up and say, can you help me? So through a friend, she started an organization. And that organization now hosts 700 children in Uganda. 700 children 
are being cared for, are hearing about Jesus, are getting meals, are getting education. Because one little high school girl said, yes, Lord. I want to close with her words. Her name is Katie Davis. Her blog, if you want to check out what she has to say, is in your notes. She has a book, a, a New York Times bestseller. She's in her 20s now, early 20s, called Kisses from Katie. It's what the book is called. Men, I'll give you a warning. When you start reading it, it sounds like a 20-year-old girl wrote it. It's very emotive. But hang on and let her take you on the ride that her story will take you on. Here's Katie's words. People tell me I am brave. People tell me I am strong. People tell me, good job. Well, here is the truth of it. I am really not that brave. I am not really that strong. I am not doing anything spectacular. I am just doing what God called me to do as a follower of Him. Feed His sheep. Do one to the least of his people. That's what it looks like to help. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for your great grace to us today. We bless you and we thank you that in your timing, you helped us by coming to the world as a man to die in the place of all people. We thank you, Father, that in your great grace and love, you've given us that example of what it looks like to help others around us. And we would just pray right now, Lord, that you would help as we reflect on your love for us, as we think through the way you work in us, that we would be open to be available to you for others, whoever they might be, neighbors or friends, people in our own house, people we've never met before. We just want to be your hands and your feet in this world. And we know, Lord, that you don't require a lot from us. We don't have to bring a lot of credentials. We simply have to be open, have a heart that's open to others. So, Father, I pray for myself today. Pray for all of us today. That whatever might stand in the way, that you would remove it, that you would soften our hearts that you would help us to grow in that openness. And as we do, Lord, that we would simply be willing to let you work your way and to do what you put on our hearts, even if it just seems to make no sense to us. Teach us, Father, to say yes to you. We thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. I'm down here if you want to talk or pray.